I, I think this is so important because there's a lot of messages out there. Let's be happy. Mm -hmm. Let me show you how to just be happy all the time. And I say that is just not realistic. I say we are human. We have this whole array of emotions for a reason. And the reason for those negative emotions is to help us learn, help us learn about ourselves, help us motivate ourselves to get and do better. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Lisa. I've been so excited to have you on. Um, I read your book, it's freaking amazing. And Thank where you. I want to start is mm -hmm. you talk about how anxiety is one of the most misunderstood emotions. Yes. And I want to start with a quote of yours okay. that says, we simply approach it as something to avoid, get rid of or dampen. We not only don't solve the problem, but actually miss an opportunity to leverage the generative power of anxiety. Yes. So talk to me about that, because obviously yeah. in this day and age, anxiety is almost seen as a disability. It is, actually. And so I start the whole book with this idea that evolutionarily, anxiety and stress is protective for us. It is something good for us. And so how can it be good? It, it helps protect us from dangers that are out there. And 2.5 million years ago, the dangers were things like lions and big animals. And so uh, it evolved that way. It evolved to help us either fight off the animal or run away. So that's the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. So even today, it is protective. That anxiety, what if the Delta variant is really bad? That That is something to be worried about. And what happens is, um, something happened between the last, uh, between 2.5 million years ago and today, and that is now we have a news feed that's 24 seven that focuses on all these terrible things going on and, and hypes it up sometimes in a way that, that may not be absolutely accurate. We have Instagram feeds going all the time that are basically sources for constant levels of fear, anxiety, stress. And so then it stops being protective. It starts to be damaging if it goes up all the time. But if we can harness the power of that brain activation energy that was evolved to put us into action to help solve these dangers in our lives, that is what I was talking about in that quote. That is what decreases the stress. That's what makes our life happier. But if we turn away and say, ah, I just, I just want to try and be happy all the time over here, even though that never happens, you miss this opportunity. It is so powerful to dig into those negative emotions and figure out what is that caused by? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I am, I am, um, inspired by or repulsed by or fearful of. And that is very valuable information for all of us. Okay, I love that. I love the whole um, understanding of where it comes from. For yeah. me, that's very um, useful for me to think through it of why, because that allows me to not judge myself yes. when it does happen. It's like, oh, well, right. it's biological, yeah. Lisa. Two million years yeah. ago, you'll be yeah. hunted by a lion, exactly. so you're glad this happened. The problem is in those moments yeah. of um, anxiety, mm -hmm. crippling anxiety, obviously right. the last thing you think of is that this is supposed yeah. to help so me. So helpful, yeah. Right. Um, so how do you start to pass that? In yeah. fact, actually, let's start from how do you start to identify when you're having the anxiety yeah. um, occur? Because in the book, you start listing all these things yeah. of um, if you notice yourself do this, then you have anxiety. I honestly never would have said that I have anxiety. Mm. Never. I would have been like, yeah, you know, I'm I'm all over the place. If you yeah. asked me what the word was, I kind yeah. of just would have said that. Uh -huh. Listening to your breakdown mm. of if you find yourself cleaning a lot, if you find yourself repeating something in your head, like all of these things, and I was like, oh my God, do I have anxiety? <laughs> but it never dawned on me. And so the reason why I would love to list those out is the people that are listening now, whether you've got severe anxiety or don't even think you have anxiety, right. starting to identify if you have or not. And mm. then we can start to piece through when you're in those moments of anxiety, how on earth do you tell yourself this feeling is great? Right, right. So, um, First, let's just start with the definition of anxiety. Anxiety is that fear and worry about something that is imminent. It's not something that has happened or is happening. It's something that could happen. It's always could. Yes, always could happen. And so 
that's anything. You know, uh, uh, um, there could be an earthquake tomorrow. Uh, that could happen. Uh, um, we could get a terrible president in the next round. That, that could happen. And, um, this is where the 24 hour news cycle and the Instagram feeds come in. Those can become sources of, oh, I don't have, I don't have that great, great outfit. I am reading the news articles and, oh, these terrible things happening all across the world. When is it going to start happening here? So, so it is, um, pervasive and uh, I'm not I'm not breaking any secrets when I say that levels of anxiety including not clinical anxiety what I call everyday anxiety mm. have gone up since the pandemic and I'll just add that I was like you I was like I don't I don't have anxiety I didn't want to admit I had anxiety so 90% of the population in the United States identify that they suffer from anxiety and I was that other 10% that actually does <laughs> uh, have anxiety, but didn't want to admit it because I like to um, uh, give the impression of always happy, always enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. And so I was very good at, at masking my anxiety. But through the process of writing the book, I was like, oh my God, I have so much anxiety. <laughs> that's anxiety and that's anxiety and that's anxiety. And so I always start with, well, what is the first thing? This is the first thing that people ask. Mm. How do I start to decrease that negative feeling? Because sometimes if it gets so bad, you, you can't do anything. You can't decide, tell yourself that it's helpful. You can't do anything. So my first recommendation, what is the most powerful thing that you can do right now to quell those feelings of anxiousness and anxiety? And that is to activate part of your nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system and that by breathing, deep breathing activates the calming part of your nervous system. So simply doing something as simple as four part breath, inhaling for four, holding for four, exhaling for four, holding out for four. You can feel it immediately starting to bring you back into the moment. And so I'm not saying this works at the depths of mm. an anxiety attack, but when you start feeling that, Take the moment and just do an experiment on yourself. Let me just see. It takes just a few seconds to do the deep breathing. You can do it in the middle of a meeting that may not be going very well. Nobody will know that you're doing it and it will work mm. to calm your nervous system. How do you then um, interrupt yourself in order to say, oh, hey, this is one of those moments you need to do yeah. that breathing? Yeah. Because normally, at least for me, when mm. I start to get anxious now that I've realized I'm anxious, yeah. I just keep repeating like in that moment yes. it's usually in hindsight mm -hmm. that i'm like oh okay i should have done the deep breathing now let me right. do it and so i still do it yeah but it's usually somewhat after the fact then right. really present in that moment yeah. but i bet you you and me and everybody else there are certain regularities in our life that bring up bring us anxiety we can say oh yeah that person oh yeah i get lots of anxiety that situation i get lots of anxiety so do a little self reflection mm. then you can predict exactly when those anxious moments are likely to occur get ready get ready with that breath to do that little experiment and just start to get more aware of those anxious moments the more you practice that the more you'll start to catch it mm. earlier and earlier so you can quell it and that that's, that's a skill. You know, it's not a pill that you take. It requires some self-reflection, which I think is one, one of the most powerful tools in this group book. How do you self-reflect productively and effectively about your own anxiety to change it? Well, how do you, Wendy? Well, <laughs> you start with observations about where your anxiety is coming. You start to implement this immediate um, breathing exercise. The book is full of toolboxes, tools. It's, it's a big toolbox of things that you can do to quell your anxiety. Mm. Not all of them are immediate. Some of them, like breathing, are. Um, the other one that I always go to, my go-to, is movement, physical activity. Go take a walk outside. Uh, you say, I'm in the office. Well, go walk up and down the stairs just once. You don't have to get all sweaty. Just move your body because I know that every single time we move our bodies, we give our brains a wonderful bubble bath of neurochemicals. Neurochemicals like dopamine and mm -hmm. serotonin that will decrease your anxiety levels. So there's tools for the immediate quelling of anxiety. There are longer term tools uh, that 
help you shift your mindset, to build up tools, to kind of rebalance. If you have too much stress and negative emotions mm -hmm. in your life, there are tools to help you consciously build more moments of positive anxiety. In fact, that's one of my favorite um, tools, which is the tool of joy conditioning. So joy conditioning is using what we know about how memory works to um, strengthen a particular memory. And the memory that I want you to strengthen is one where the emotions that you felt were just yummy and happy or funny, whatever you choose. Use your own personal memory to come up with one of those emotions. And the trick that I add in the book is that we know that smell or scent mm. is a really powerful way to evoke all other aspects of a memory. So the example I give from my life is that um, I have a memory of this amazing yoga class that I went to. The teacher was great. I got into all the positions. I was feeling really good. <laughs> and then, and then I went down to do the pose that I'm best at, which is Shavasana. So I was in Shavasana and, uh, the teacher came around. I was feeling so good. It's like, I just, I crushed it. And the teacher came around and she waved some lavender scent under my nose. My eyes were closed. She gave me the most luscious five second neck massage that I've ever had. And when I need just that memory of the feeling of I did really well and I got this extra surprise, mm -hmm. I literally go around with a little vial of lavender because it brings me back to that. And the more I evoke that, the more, the stronger those positive memories are. I love the smell thing. It's called, you called it the olfactory yes. cue? Yes. I'd never heard of it mm. referred to as that Yeah, way. yeah. So the scent of smell is also called your olfactory scent. And the first nerve is called the olfactory nerve, which is your the nerve that brings in all the scent information. Explain exactly what happens because I remember being a kid and smelling something and it hit me emotionally yeah. very hard. Mm -hmm. And so now actually as an adult, yeah. I often will wear my husband's clothes. Like if he's not around yeah. and I just want to find comfort, yeah. I actually will just put a sweater of his on, yeah. but not a clean one, one that actually <laughs> smells like him yeah. because of the smell. So what is actually yeah. going on between yeah. the, the the yeah. sensories. Yeah, so we know know the answer to that. And the answer is that the part of the brain really important for laying down new memories is called the hippocampus. And most of the other senses, all of the other senses, vision, you know, touch, hearing, they have to go through many, many, many different um, connections before they get to the hippocampus. Mm. Lots of highly processed information. However, olfaction, that sense of smell, is the only sense that goes directly into the hippocampus. Why is that? Well, probably because the sense of smell is very ancient. Mm. So that was one of our first sense, mm. senses. And it was very important that that particular modality get into memory. So danger scent, if there is, mm. you know, whatever, the bear scent or the lion scent, that we get that into our memory banks very, very quickly. And it has stayed with us after these millions of years, which is why we have all had that. Oh, I remember that reminds me of grandma's, you know, grandma's table and mm. having dinner around grandma's table. And it can be so evocative because the the um, sense of smell is naturally evocative of um, retrieving a whole range of memories that we have. Wow, that's so fascinating. So how do you actually then use it? How would you advise someone yeah. that is having, you know, anxiety to use yeah. that sensory to be able mm -hmm. to, um, you know, bring down their anxiety? Yeah. So this is how I talk about it in the book. So um, joy conditioning, this, this idea about bringing the sense memory in that some full, that, that brings a joyful memory up is a direct counter action to, um, fear conditioning that happens all the time. This is our natural, reflex that if something really bad happens, like if here something, some big bad thing exploded right here and we got mud all over our clothes here, maybe I wouldn't have a good association. I would not have a good association with these couches. Mm. And that is protective because if bad things happen in a certain spot, this happens when you get robbed or, you know, mugged, you naturally, you start to get fearful when you go to that same location that happens automatically. Mm. Well, if we just think about that, it's like, oh, how depressing. This is, I just build up all these negative, fearful memories. Well, let's build up some positive memories and we consciously bring up 
the most joyful memories of our life. When is the last time you thought about your top five joyful memories in your life? Ooh, not too often. Yeah, I don't do it. I didn't do it, but now I do certain ones that mm. have these olfactory mm. scents, but it just reminds me, oh my God, you know, there's all of these wonderful memories, memories with families, memories with friends. I just had a dinner last night. That's going to be one of my joy conditioning mm. memories of, of the smell of um, LA that has a particular sm smells very different from Midtown Manhattan. I'll tell you that. <laughs> And but but just wonderful friends outside eating California fresh food. Ah, oh, my favorite thing. And what if we just think about those more? It brings up those joyful feelings more. And you have control over that. It's not the world mm. kind of forcing you into these reflexive things. If I want to bring up these joyful memories, maybe that's a wonderful thing to do in the morning. Mm. What is your morning joyful memory? What is your evening? joyful memory to fall asleep to. Mm. So I love that. Can you um, create your own then? So like for instance, let's say people listening at home, they're like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I actually have one. Mm. Like, could you almost go, mm, all right, I'm going to get the smell of cinnamon mm -hmm. and I'm going to hang out with my friends. And every time I exactly. hang out with my friends, I'm going to smell cinnamon. Yes. And now over time, yes. I've created the thing where every time mm. I smell cinnamon, I get a nice warm feeling because yes. it reminds me of my friends. I love that idea. I did not talk it. That comes directly from Lisa. <laughs> New. Yes. <laughs> Wendy approved. <laughs> New tool uh, that we will use for good anxiety. I hope everybody uses it for good anxiety. But absolutely, you, you can do that. Create that. Re and that's also uh, this new awareness mm. you know this is a this is a wonderful new memory mm. here and and let's let's um, let's put that into my library of joy conditioning be proactive about it and that will just kind of increase that all of those good feelings that you have during the day so I actually really want to talk about something that you talk about which is foolish reframing mm. of people reframing the situation but it actually doesn't end up serving them because I love reframing yeah. I think it really can yes. just like you've done with the book where you've taken anxiety and made it a good thing yes and um, yes. but talk to me about where people can take that too far yeah so this comes from a story in the book a brilliant friend of mine who said you know I've never been rejected from uh, she's a journalist no, no editor has ever rejected me. I was, wow, I knew people from Harvard were smart, but I didn't realize they, you know, they reached that level. And then she went a little bit deeper and said, well, I, it's not that I've never been rejected. It's just that I've gotten something useful out of even the, you know, editor letters that say, you know, I'm sorry, but this, this is not, this is just a load of BS. terrible stuff. BS, yes, yes. <laughs> And, you know, she, she approaches that as, thank you. You know, that's so useful. That's such useful information. It's not a rejection because she, she will go turn around and, and get it in someplace else. So it's not a global rejection. It is a new piece of information. And I, I questioned, uh, you know, do I want to apply that in my toolbox? And I said, no, you know, I like to call a big failure, a big failure. And I think it's healthy to be able to, um, uh, to be able to admit that and, uh, to learn from it because everybody has failures. And I didn't want, it, it's hard to understand. I didn't want to go around saying, I never had any failures. So I don't know. Mm. I don't know that. I, I think this brings up a wonderful and really important idea from the book, which is, Negative emotions like embarrassment and fear and worry, they are very useful for mm -hmm. us. So yeah, when I say, you know, there was this big failure that I had, it makes me embarrassed. It makes me uncomfortable. Um, but it's important to lean into that because only by kind of getting more comfortable with these so-called negative emotions, can you say, okay, I accept them. They're there. What can I learn from them? Mm. It's not like it, it erased all the failures. It was a failure, but it got me to this direction or it left me stuck for a little while and I was wallowing around in this in a little while, which also happens. It's, it's reality. I, I think this is so important because there's a lot of messages out there. Let's be happy. Mm. Let me show you how to just be happy all the time. And I say that is just not realistic. I say we are human. We have this 
whole array of emotions for a reason. And the reason for those negative emotions is to help us learn, help us learn about ourselves, help us motivate ourselves to get and do better. If I was happy all the time, would you want a bride on her wedding day to help you get things done? Or do you want somebody that has a little fire underneath them and you really wants to prove themselves? I'll take the person with a little fire and maybe a little anxiety um, every single day. That is the power of these emotions. And when we start to embrace them, only then do we start to appreciate what they bring to our lives. Good, I love that. What I have found is there's two types of camps. Mm. There's camp A, that's you. No, 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 call it a failure. Yeah. I do on purpose. I want it to sting. I want to feel the shame yeah. because it's that that's going to get me to act. Yes. I freaking love that girl. I am with you in camp A. We are having yes. hamburgers together yeah. and we are sitting in the sun <laughs> talking about this. In the other camp, yeah. it's the people that find that extremely detrimental, mm. that they find that owning it by, by feeling the shame, yeah. that it becomes detrimental to their self-esteem and mm -hmm. makes them not act and actually do the opposite and retreat. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to the people that are in the other camp yeah. that um, almost do it to protect themselves? Yeah. Is yeah. it still useful? Um, yes. I mean, at certain points in our development, it can be useful. As I just said, I was in the camp, I'm not anxious. I'm, I'm happy <laughs> all the time. Mm. So that's a little bit of foolish reframing, right? No, I wasn't happy all the time, but I wanted everybody else to believe I was happy all the time. And so what changed? It was, I learned more about myself. I got more realistic, um, with myself. And when you say realistic, what do you mean? I don't know if there's any other perfectionists out there, but I am a big and have always been a big perfectionist and that it was either perfection or utter failure. Mm. And that is not realistic. It is a learning experience. And everybody said, oh yeah, you learn more from your failures than your, and I would say, yeah, yeah, I've heard of that, but, but I, I like to be perfect all the time. And, um, it was, it was living that and, learning from that. And um, it was actually an experience like that that was really the origin story of how this book became this book. And that experience was something that we'll all have to go through, which was um, unexpected losses, deaths in my family. Both my father and my younger brother passed away within three months of each other. And talk about like a tidal wave of, of these horrible grief and, and anger and, and just unknown, unnameable <laughs> emotions. I didn't even know what I was feeling. Um, and having to go through that, and that was a very difficult, difficult time. And slowly coming out because I had tools in my toolbox that helped meditation, movement, I've always had a positive, maybe too positive, you know, I want to be perfect, but, but mm -hmm. I use that and it helped me realize how much wisdom comes from great pain. And, um, it was actually a trainer that I was working out with and she said, with great pain comes great wisdom. And I said, that's what I've been realizing that I'm so, I'm so incredibly grateful and lucky to be alive. And um, that, that's kind of hard to accept because there's a lot of guilt. It's like, why was I with the one that, that, that stayed here? And I, um, I realized going through that, that all of those negative emotions are helpful. And in fact, I needed to find the power behind those negative emotions. And that is why this book became what it did because I was going through that and, and finding the deeper love that I had at the end of that for, for my family that that's there, that it, it was there. It's not like I didn't love them, mm -hmm. but there was a, a heightened level of appreciation. There was more wisdom there. And I wanted to help people find their wisdom and their joy through the difficult emotion of anxiety. And that's why I called it misunderstood, mm. that people think it's something to leave behind and shut in the closet door, but it's actually there to help us learn and to improve our lives. 
Wow, thank you for sharing that. Um, in reading your book in that story, actually, the very first thing I did is I text my brother. Mm. And yeah. I just, I was like, I j you better know. I, li I literally was like, you better already know this, <laughs> but I'm just telling you anyway. <laughs> I was like, I just need you to know how important you are to me and how much yeah. I love you. And I told him I just read your book and I was yeah. like, you know, oh. um, her brother died and I never want to miss an opportunity. Yeah to ever say that and yeah. he was like you know of course I know that but it never hurts to always hear it yes. so thank you so thank yeah. you Wendy for oh, uh, you know you. kind of reminding me to reach out to my brother and say that yeah. you know it's like you can never replace um you can never go back in time yeah. and so always trying to make sure that I'm showing up in my true self and really pushing is so important yeah, so it really thank is. you for sharing that thank you yeah um Talk to me about you, talk about um, Don't Stop the Playlist of What If. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that notion. Yeah. So uh, a big theme in this book, because it's a big theme of my own personal anxiety, is the What If list. So anxiety, once I admit it that I have it, um, comes to me right before I go to sleep. And I'm about to go to sleep. I'm looking forward to it. It's feeling really good. And then boom. Like, what if you forget, what if, uh, Lisa asks you a question and you don't know how to answer it? What if, you know, all the interviews do go terribly? What if, you know, you get fired tomorrow? And I start thinking about this what if list. And I think that is a very common form of anxiety that hits us at many different, in many different ways and in many different parts of the day. And so, um, how, what do you do with that? How do you switch that? And um, the answer came in um, at a birthday party when I was talking to a lawyer about writing this book, Good Anxiety. And she said, oh, anxiety? Anxiety made me the lawyer that I am today. And I said, oh, do tell. What do you mean? She said, well, I take all those worries and all those anxieties that keep me up late at night, and I make them into the strongest case that I can. Because they're all things that, you know, the other side might bring up. What is it the judge asks this? Mm. And so I go through mm. and I address them all. And with each addressing of each point, I feel better and better and better. And in fact, what I end up doing is when that anxiety, worry, what if list comes up, because it still does, I say, never mind. I'm going to take care of that first thing tomorrow morning. Mm. I could go to sleep right now because it's going to be taken care of. It takes a little practice, but it actually turns your worry into an action, mm -hmm. which is the original purpose of anxiety or, or the stress response in the first place. It gets um, kind of co-opted if you just take that worry and just do nothing and just sit here and be paralyzed with worry, which, which can happen. So I try and give people um, step by steps for how to take that worry and put it into action so you can dissipate your anxiety. That makes complete sense going back to how we started this interview where you said anxiety basically is the fear of something about to happen. Yes, exactly. So by addressing them, by allowing anxiety to have a voice, yeah. if you will, you're now letting it speak. Mm -hmm. It's saying what it's worried about and it yeah. allows you the opportunity to then um, turn up prepared. Yes. I love that. So let's actually talk about um, social anxiety. It's a real thing. And I'm hearing mm -hmm. a lot of people are getting anxious about going into, you know, the real world, if you will. How do people start preparing for those types of situations? Because instinct, I think, is mm -hmm. to not go out, right? It's like, yeah. oh, this causes me anxiety. This causes me stress. Well, let's not just, let's not do it then. Right. And I fear that that just gets worse and worse. Yeah. The, the more you stay home, yeah. the more you stay, you know, isolated. Yeah. Well, my best tip is to think about those friends that, that you admire for their ability to, you know, uh, be great social, uh, uh, butterflies and they could, those are the people that talk to everybody, maybe your funniest friends and, um, hang out with them invite them to come mm -hmm. with you. So you have a wing man or a wing woman, one that, that you like, you admire, you know that they're always, you know, good at doing that. So it gets the ball rolling. So you have a little bit of a runway. So, you know, they warm, warm it up and you can jump in and, um, don't, you, you don't necessarily have to rely, you know, you're not going to go by yourself to a bar to start to meet people now, but, but keep it, um, keep it friendly, not a huge group, but maybe, uh, one or two people that, that will make Make you feel more comfortable. We are social animals, and um, I think that social um, that social component, using it in the positive way, even though there's a lot of social anxiety, 
we all have friends that we admire that way and, um, um, and use them, use them. I actually have a quote of yours that really hit me and I kind of want to go de uh, deep down. Um, we now know that there are serious health risks associated with loneliness. For yeah. example, one meta-analysis that examined 300,000 patients showed that lonely people have a 50% greater probability of death yeah. compared to patients with adequate social relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 50%. 50%. And on the flip side, uh, the number one um, predictor of a longer life is um, large numbers of social interactions, including not just, you know, the, the girlfriend that you've had since you were three, mm. but friendly relationships with the person that makes your coffee, mm. with um, anybody. Keeping those alive, getting good at just having a, a friendly banter, so important. We have evolved to be a social species. And so this is why this loneliness is affecting us. And it tends to affect older people more because they get isolated. Deafness is associated with high levels of mortality because there's nothing that gets you more isolated more quickly than deafness. Whoa. You cannot hear the conversation and nobody can tell that you're deaf. So you get isolated even more. It's like, why aren't you joining in? I can't tell. I can't tell that you can't hear me or understand me. Well, even more than sight? Uh, yes, Whoa. absolutely. And in fact, wow. I learned this as an undergraduate that um, um, deafness is the, w the most isolating of the sensory deprivations. Because when you're blind, most people can tell you're blind. You're wearing glasses or you have a guide dog, you have a cane. And, um, and so they can immediately mm. identify you. But somebody that's deaf, it's much more difficult to... Um, to get that, and so they tend to get, mar it's easier for them to be marginalized and left out of verbal conversations mm -hmm. that they can't participate in. So yeah, both of those things, um, and we're talking about loneliness, loneliness, it does contribute to um, higher levels of loneliness. It's so weird then that when you ha get anxious or you know it starts to really build up inside you that you want to then be more alone. Yes. Well, just because it's good for you doesn't mean that you naturally gravitate <laughs> toward it. All right? I don't mean, you're so right, girl. I mean, let's talk about chicken and broccoli. No one gravitates naturally to chicken and broccoli. People gravitate towards ice cream. Exactly. So actually, that's actually very yes. interesting. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's part of that. Um, everything becomes overwhelming mm. and um, you want to, um, yeah, you don't want to have to deal with it because a lot of it is social anxiety. So I'm not feeling good. Do I want to go out and, and interact? No, I want to be alone right. with my with my own anxiety and right. not get any more anxious, even though it's worse to, to stay alone. So it's, it's, a, it's a vicious circle that way, which is why you need lots of different kinds of tools to bring you out. The memory tool, the, the joy conditioning tool, uh, breath, movement, um, laughter. Um, we need a little vending machine uh, of different options mm -hmm. to really find those things that work for us uh, immediately or on the short term that we could practice, that we enjoy practicing um, to get us out of that anx anxiety. Yeah, well, your TED talk, which is huge, by the way, is you, you know, it ends on you doing exercise, yes. but also like yelling out these affirmations. Yes. Can you explain to me a little about the combination between the body movement and the affirmations? Yeah. So um, I did that because that is the uh, workout that helped me lose 25 pounds when I needed to lose 25 pounds and I went to the gym. And this workout, which is called Intensati, um, combines physical movements from kickbox and dance and yoga and martial arts with positive spoken affirmations. And I bring it into my talks because it's a little bit silly and nobody really wants to yell out these affirmations. But then you do it just once and it's like, yeah, I am powerful. And very quickly you feel that power. So it's a combination of the physical movement that works to give your brain a wonderful bubble bath of neurochemicals like noradrenaline, dopamine, serotonin. But the positive affirmations is that psychological boost, that declaration 
of these things that we have you say, we don't have you say, you know, I feel fat today. No, I am inspired. I feel like I believe I will succeed. Um, I am on fire right now. And um, um, if you say it, if you declare it, I mean, what's the last time you walked down the street and said, I am on fire right now. <laughs> and um, that's people leave <clears throat> thinking that. Mm. And so it's this quick way mm. to get people into both a positive mindset, but in a way that moves their body. I love that. Um, can you actually take me down? I never heard of the five types of anxiety management that you do. Mm. Um, do you mind taking me through those? Sure, sure. They're just time points in the experience of anxiety um, where you can emotionally regulate and get yourself out of the bad anxiety. And so the first one is what we already talked about, which is think about these situations that you know, you've known all your life that, or for a long time, they will give you anxiety and prepare for them. Maybe you can think about a different way to have the interview that gives you more power, makes you feel more comfortable to change the situation. Then comes the um, tools to emotionally regulate when you start to feel those butterflies. And we talked about too, deep breathing, um, that will activate your parasympathetic nervous system, that calms your nervous system naturally. And, um, well, you can't very well get up and start moving around, but mm -hmm. if you know you're gonna feel anxious, go up and down the stairs, take a, take a quick power walk mm -hmm. up and down the hallway before you start. It'll get yourself into that calmer state once you get in that situation. The next one is if there is a topic or a person that is causing that anxiety, you can simply deflect attention from that. Try and avoid it. Um, we do this all the time with our kids. If there's a scary dog over there that's gonna mm -hmm. cause a lot of fear, anxiety, what do you do? So, oh, look at the playground over there. Mm -hmm. Look at the fire truck. Mm -hmm. Well, do that for yourself. And um, it's a great way. It, just because that scary person or that scary question is there, doesn't mean you have to go there. You can um, tactfully and thoughtfully avoid that to decrease your anxiety. Uh, and then after the fact, as you were saying, you know, sometimes after the fact, you think, oh, I wish I had done that, that and that. <laughs> well, put that into action. And so this is where mindset comes in. And uh, for example, um, if you have fear of speaking in public, fear of interviews, if you got through it using some of those emotional regulation kind of tools, you can tell yourself, you know, that wasn't so bad. Mm -hmm. I got through it. Look at all those tools that I use. And, and I didn't use that first one. Maybe I, I should have done the deep breathing a little bit longer. Maybe I'll try that next time. Come up with strategies to kind of improve that. Think about it as instead of a, um, a, a task that you have to get through as a challenge. So, what can I do to make this experience, make make my interview experience a better one for me? What do I have to do to do that? So if you address it like a positive challenge, uh, that is again for the future, things that you can do and start honing it. I think we have to get our, away from the idea, oh, it's terrible, I don't want to do it, let me just get through it, I'm not even going to think about it, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try anything new, it's just going to be horrible, and I'm just going to go through it, and it's inevitable. Well, I'm here to tell you it's not inevitable. We can regulate our emotions, we can learn how to do it, and I am so um, optimistic about are everybody's ability to do that because the main theme of my whole science career has been brain plasticity. Mm -hmm. Our ability to learn and change um, our brain response in response to the environment. Now we can change it in the negative way and just end up being this, you know, puddle of anxiety, mm -hmm. but we can learn and change. And those steps that I just went through are those steps of learning and changing and tweaking and mm -hmm. trying to do better every time, that is brain plasticity. That is positive brain plasticity happening right now. And you can shift that negative anxiety. That is, that is the brain power that you are going to be using to shift that negative anxiety response to a positive one. I love that you said that because I think that it's important for people to remember that they, they are, they can do that. It yeah. isn't just a fundamental, a 
um, base that can never be changed. Yes, exactly. And I think a lot of people, um, it's a um, defeatist attitude. Yes. And I don't think people mean to. Mm -hmm. I think it just like when it really truly, be you believe it. Yes. Um, but then becomes so defeatist that yeah. you don't pick yourself back up. Right, right. And it is modifiable. I mean, mm. think of your brain as a big ball of silly putty. Mm. What do you want to make that brain mm. into? How do you want to teach your brain to respond to these situations. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're never going to pull out. I'm never going to feel sad or never going to be fear, feel fear again. No, you want to feel that fear, but you want to use that mm. activation that comes with fear to propel yourself, not to, you know, go back down to, to, uh, uh, a terrible, terrible anxiety. So that, that is the goal. That is the superpower that I was hoping to get to. Um, when I wrote this book. I love that girl. Um, you talk about cognitive reminders in your book. Yeah. Um, and there's this study, I don't know if you've heard of it, mm -hmm. where they take a bunch of women yeah. and before they go into a math test, uh -huh. they basically remind them, hey, you're a woman. Mm -hmm. And because typically men are supposed to, supposed to yes. quote unquote, be better at math than women, yeah. women actually end up doing worse when they're reminded that they're women. Yeah. Now I've also heard that that same test, they took these women and the women that were Asian, they mm -hmm. went up to them like, you're Asian. Mm -hmm. And then they go into the math test and they crush it. Yeah. So like the power of cognitive reminders yeah, yeah. is just insane. It and going insane. to what you were saying about superpowers, yeah. it's super impressive that this can be a superpower or a kryptonite, right. depending on how you choose to exactly, use it. Exactly, exactly. So that is really the power of mindset. So what do you believe about yourself? And if you believe that women are bad at math and they can't do engineering, then you will perform worse on math and engineering tests. But if your mom and your family have always told you, you have an amazing brain. You can excel at whatever you learn because your brain is able to learn whatever you want. You want to do well on tests? Study. Your brain will suck mm. that in. You know, I, I want to give, there's a gift that I could give everyone. It is the gift of the knowledge that the human brain is the most powerful structure known to humankind. And it was designed to learn. That means, I don't care if you said, I'm always bad at math, I've always been bad at math, I've always been bad at spelling. Oh my God, I'm, now I'm talking not, this is not hypothetical. <laughs> this is a <laughs> real, I'm like yeah. revealing it to you. I'm a terrible speller. And I know what I need to do to be a better speller. In fact, I'm a much better mm. speller in French when I took French classes because I knew it was really bad and I memorized all the spellings of all the words that I thought I would have to use on the essays. Mm. And so I spelled them correctly because I really paid attention to them. You can train your brain to learn anything. If you remember that, that is the best mindset that you can go into life with. I love that because that reminder is even if I fail, I can learn. Yeah. Even if I don't know now, I can learn. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm always trying to, like you said, the book is such a great toolbox. I'm always trying to think about what tools I can use in certain situations. Yes. And when I'm not feeling confident, when I'm not feeling like I necessarily um, have the uh, either intellect or skill to bring to the table, yeah. I'll be, I'll, I love the cognitive reminder. And mm -hmm. I'll say to myself, all right, Lisa, you may not know this yet. Yeah. Right. And it, it lowers my anxiety. Yes. It lowers yes. the the angst of, oh my God, what are people going to say? Mm -hmm. Are they going to judge me? Yeah. Um, and I just, it relieves that. Yeah. And I remind myself of who I am. Mm -hmm. And I used to remind myself, all oh, the negativity. Yeah. Oh, well, remember, Lisa, you're dumb. Yeah. Like what, you don't belong there. Remember when you failed at that, right? So the cognitive mind was a total de detriment yes. to my self-esteem, yeah. how I showed up every day. Right. And when I realized, oh, I can just change the reminder that yes. I'm telling myself. Yeah. And then what do I want that to be? It's mm -hmm. so freaking powerful. It's so powerful. And you can shape your, your daily life with what you tell yourself in the morning. Um, that is, that is right there, the mind body connection. Mm. It's not just in the mind. You can change your physiology. There are studies that show that if, um, um, that patients getting anesthesia, get more pain relief if somebody in a white coat comes to <gasps> give them, it's like, oh, okay, I'm giving it versus whether it's automatic. Shut up. Yes. 
So it's okay. You're 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 help. You're taking care of me. Yes, I I feel I feel the relief, and it's it's that belief. It's like you're you're helping me. You're going to help me feel better, and I do feel better. It's a physiological response. So um, there are so many tools and so many um, um, functions that we can take advantage of of our brain that are very practical that you can do that you can practice that you can get better at. And that is how you can learn about yourself, make your life less stressful, and learn more about your emotions in general, which I think is very, very powerful. I love that. Um, I had no intention of doing this. I'm just going to surprise you on this. Okay. Are you down for doing like an, an outro with like the kick and the, like sure. the exercise? Sure. I just want to like show people what you're freaking made of, All girl. right. All right. Let's All do right. it. We're going to do on the wide camera. Are okay. we ready? Okay. Let's do it, ready. girl. Okay. And then, so in fact, while, we, while we're setting up, tell everybody at home where they can find your book. Okay. You can get my book on... All the outlets, Amazon.com, yes. SimonSchuster.com. I recorded the audio of it so you can get it on Audible.com. That was so much fun to be able to do that. Whew. It was hard to read 260 pages out loud, but we did it. And um, and also go to wendysuzuki.com and um, join our Good Anxiety Citizen Science Project. So you can be part of these experiments where we are testing the effectiveness of different interventions, short meditations, mm. short conversations, short stories that you can listen to to look at the effects on your anxiety. And that's on your website? Yes. Go All right, we'll website. put the links down below. And like I said, I just surprised this woman. She, as she was talking, I was like, I, I got to do it. So her TED Talk, this is exactly what she does. This is what she was talking about, about mind-body connection, how to overcome the anxiety. Let's do it. What okay. are we doing? Ready? Yes. We are. All right. Punches back and forth. Go right, left, right, left. And I say, I am really uh, strong. You say it. I am really strong and i am wonder woman strong you say i am wonder woman strong i'm we are really really strong you we are really really strong what up guys, thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like another dose of badassery, make sure you watch this video right here because I know you like it. But hey, also, while you're here guys, you might as well click that subscribe button down there so you don't miss any future episodes. And of course, until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out.